we're, we're looking at going purely from the small space back to the original x variables. Okay, so we're looking at just going from t's, assuming we were given a set of t's that we wanted to achieve to go back to the x's. But that's not an entirely realistic problem for product development. For the previous part, we were looking at Categorizing our data, or characterizing our, our observations. For example, our competitors' product versus ourselves. We're in the small space already, and we go back to the original experience. But in this particular example, or sorry, in this particular section, we're going to be more interested in going from our Y's back to our original X's. So, given a new desired settings for Y that we would like to achieve. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to first go back to the scores, and then once we've got the scores, we're going to go back to the x's. And okay, so that, that's one particular way of doing it. And by the end of this class, we'll be able to go straight from the y's to the x's, but still obeying what the scores are doing internally. Okay. So what, to understand what, what's going on here, it's really, really critical to realize that we've got a model for both the x space and the y space. And that, space has a common link, the scores. So the model for the x space is, is this one over here, for, for PLS. This is the PLS model for the x space. So it looks like a PCA equation, and it, it is the same, but for PLS, this describes how we predict the x space, because it's saying x is equal to TP transpose plus an error. That TP transpose is our prediction for the x space. So PLS is unique amongst all the regression type models in that it has a model for the x space. All other regression models just go from the x's to the y and have a model for the y space, but don't build a model for the x space. The model for the y space has the same structure as the x space. It says y is equal to tc transpose plus an error f. So tc transpose is our best prediction of y. In other words, y hat is equal to TC transpose. Once we have our scores T, we can get our predictions of Y by multiplying by the C transpose matrix. In our X space, X hat, once we have our scores T, we can get our prediction of X by multiplying by P transpose. Okay? So the commonality here are these scores T. That's what's holding it all together. And in fact, it's exactly how PLS calculates those scores. When PLS calculates the scores, remember the Nepal's algorithm flips between the X space and the Y space. Okay, I don't have that slide up here, but it keeps going between both spaces until it converges on a set of scores, T, that explains X well, using this equation, and it explains Y well, and it also explains, uh, it finds those scores so that the correlation between X and Y is maximized or covariance rather between x and y is maximized. Okay. So we really have to bear that in mind, that there's a common dimension here, t, between the x and the y space, and it's found from both data matrices simultaneously. This also holds for multi-block data sets, because last class we showed that even if we've got multiple x blocks over here, we can still push them all together with appropriate pre-processing and then build a PLS model in the usual way. So when I'm talking here about PLS models, for the rest of this class today, you can assume and work with the fact that perhaps this X space is a multi-block X space. It doesn't have to be a single block of X. We're going to use that, that as well later on. So where we're going with this is we want to use these databases that we've got on previous products that we've made to get to a new particular product or, or a variation on an existing product much faster than we would normally do. Okay. So we've got in our companies a lot of historical information on how we've developed our products, which raw materials we used, what are the ratios of those raw materials, and what settings did we use in our reactors and our equipment to get to those, those products. Okay. So it's very it's, it's a lot of hard work, I have to admit. Most companies don't have this information easily available, but it is available. You can usually get from a, from a company the ratios of the raw materials they, they use, the settings of the equipment and the reactors that are used during the production, 
as well as which ingredients should be used. And once you've got those three pieces of information, you can relate that up to the wide space of the, that, that is the characteristics of the product. So what, what happens though in most companies, let's just, uh, let's just look at, at, at what happens in other companies before we look at how to do it properly. So what companies tend to do is, if they want to make a new product, they tend to go look at their database of previous products they've made and they find the one that's most similar to the one that's required. So once they've found a particular product that's most similar to the new product that they need, they go and vary the ratios of the raw materials and the process settings. Those are the first two things they'll go vary. So they say, well, I want to get make a new product that's very similar to this existing one. I'm going to tweak my raw material ratios and maybe the settings, the temperature and the pressure in my, in my reactor to achieve that objective. Very seldom will they go and pick totally new materials or a different set of raw materials. Okay? For one is that's really hard to implement in practice because most <coughs> companies' systems are set up to dose and, and add a particular raw material. If they change to a different raw material, they might need new piping. They need new protocols in their, in their purchasing department to, to handle these new raw materials. So if they can't get it right by adjusting the ratio of the raw materials and processing, of course they'll go change the raw materials themselves, but that's really a last resort. And mostly this is by trial and error by people been in the company a long time and have experience, they've created all these previous products in the past. So they've got some very good judgment on what to adjust and, and change to get to this desired new point. So they'll often do it by trial and error, or sometimes they'll go use the design experiment approach. Just a, a bit of background here, what's, what's driving all of this is it's, it's very common for customers to want very minor changes on an existing product. So if I'm purchasing something from a particular company, I like what I'm buying right now, but I might want to change things just a little bit differently so that maybe in my process, that new product will use less energy, or I'm hoping it might be cheaper, or it might have some other desirable properties that I've determined myself. So it's not, it's very common to see this, and what happens is that when you go to a supplier, they'll often have product families so they'll provide you a particular surfactant with very minor variations. And you know that that's happened because their other customers have asked for minor tweaks along the line. So they'll have product EX1, EX-2, EX-3, because it's all still product EX with very minor changes because they've had previous customers asking for these tweaks. So it's very common to see this. The other thing that we're seeing quite, quite a lot of now is there's a huge trend in the market for salesmen and for sales, sales people, I guess salesmen, sales people to listen much more carefully to their customer and also measure more information and data on their customers, so analytics and, and that sort of thing. So what you'll find is that when you, when you have a salesperson come to your company, they'll be listening quite carefully for what, you, what uh, things you're asking for and, and mentioning. And they're listening for cues for changes in the market. And what happens is that there's very minor changes in the market and the first company to get and to that change and get a product out there will be the one that's profiting from it. Okay. So if, they, if, the, if the salesperson in a company is really good and listening carefully to you, they can go feed that information back to their engineers and their product development staff so that they can get a product available in the market far faster than the other competitors. Okay. But the problem with these very short cycles is that by the time some company get that product onto the market, the market has already moved on to a, a different set of requirements. Okay. So if you can get to the market with a product that meets the customer's demands, far faster than the competitor, there's a longer window for which you can profit. Okay. Because there's a lot of work to develop a new product. It has to be tested, quality assurance has to take place. You have to develop advertising for it perhaps and, and tell your target audience that this is now available. But if your target audience is gonna move on to the next best thing very shortly after that, you've got a very short window from which you can actually make money on all of this. Um, 
So the faster you can do this, the better. And then finally, we, uh, there's a lot of this internal cost cutting. The companies want to say, I want to make the same product, but cheaper, with cheaper raw materials. That's another form of product development. We're not necessarily developing a new product. We're developing an old product, in fact, with the same settings and specifications as before, but we want to do it cheaper and with different raw materials. And in fact, most of the case studies we'll see today come into this category. Um, though the method we'll look at can easily handle a totally new product being developed. But nine times out of 10, companies want the same product, but just in a cheaper way. Or there might be government regulations that have come in and, and changed your criteria. For example, salt, there's a huge drive to eliminate salt from products and trans fats, but you still want the taste and the texture and the properties of the food to taste the same but without these ingredients. Okay. So we work backwards with product development. This is why this is a, a latent variable conversion, because we're going from our Y's back to our original X's. So we start by specifying what we want. So let's take an example. This is, this is an actual case study where a company is designing a particular food. They've identified that there's a demand in the market for a food that has a new set of properties. It needs to have a particular color, so an, an, an one appearance attribute. Then there's three analytical attributes. It needs to have a certain trans fat value, salt value, and acidity. And there's four other sensory or organoleptic attributes. So these are taste and mouth feel type of things. So there's a texture property that's required, crispiness, a certain concentration of a, of a particular flavor ingredient, and a smell. So the product does have a smell normally, but that smell needs to be maintained. And then there's the requirement of the shelf life of the product. So we're going to assume that we've got exact values for these right now. And we're going to create a new vector called Y desired that contains those specific values. I'll look at the case where sometimes companies say, I don't really care what it is as long as it's within certain upper and lower bounds. So we'll, we'll handle that later. But for now, we're going to assume a Y desired is, is a perfectly specified matrix, a vector rather, that contains these new requirements that we want to achieve. Okay, uh, just to put, to put this work in perspective, none of this is my own doing. Um, all, this, all these examples and case studies come from previous uh, thesis from John McGregor students. So the first one was Christiana Jeffler in the late 1990s. She uh, wrote her thesis and a bunch of papers on this topic, particularly for uh, uh, how you operate reactors and systems like that. Then Koji uh, uh, from Japan, he came here as a student on uh, an exchange from Mitsubishi, so a rubber plastics company in Japan, and worked with almost all of his thesis was on data from Mitsubishi, but he also did some work on the, uh, data from the Vasco. And a lot of interesting case studies in, in, in these are just two of his papers, there's a few others, and then his thesis as well is very easy to read and, uh, and is what we're going to look at in fact in today's class. Then uh, Salvador, uh, his thesis and his papers look at batch data sets, and in fact there's one other thesis I don't have mentioned, there's the Seuss Flores uh, Rios thesis, um, also looks at batch data, I think I referenced it later on. Then Emily Nichols has a case study that we'll look at a bit later. Jun Liu has a case study that we'll look at a bit later. Uh, those are referenced further down. So I, these are, there's a lot of work here available on different categories, um, rubber, food, plastics, and so on. That's worth reading about. Okay, so let's get back uh, to, to what, we're, what we're trying to do. I'm going to first show you how companies do it now. How, Companies do use their databases in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way, but there's a shortcoming with what they do, and we'll show how to do it better. So what companies do at the moment is they say, I've got a database of n previous products. So recipe one, two, three, up to recipe n, or product one, two, three, up to product n. And they have the settings that they used on their reactors to make those products, okay? So average temperature, pressure, uh, all the settings that are required to get to that product. 
they also have a, a ratio matrix R, or a recipe matrix R. And R contains the mass ratios of the various ingredients used. Okay? So the first column is ingredient one, second column ingredient two, up till the final ingredient K subscript I. Ingredients. And every row tells you which mass ratio of that ingredient to use. So maybe you need to use 20% of an oil and 5% of salt and 30% flour. Okay, so the values within a row must add up to one. And we use mass ratios because we're, we don't go use the actual values of flour and salt and oil added because every recipe will be slightly different and, and it's more easy and, and generalizable if we just use mass ratios. Okay. So within each row, the, the, the ratios must add up to one. So there will in fact be a lot of zeros in here, especially if the number of recipes cover a broad variety of products. Okay. You will have a lot of zeros because some of your recipes won't use any of the particular ingredients or raw materials. And then your final matrix is M columns measured from your lab or otherwise for every one of those particular recipes that you've run. So this is a, the standard data set. And it's not easy to get from companies. In fact, it's a, the problem with this particular area of work is that most times in, in the companies, they consider this sort of data trade secret. So they'll almost never share it with you. And then secondly, even within a company, there's no single person that knows all this information. So it's different databases across different companies within the same company. So it's very hard to actually assemble a data set like this. But this is, this is the requirement uh, for, for product development. And companies that do this will have this data available in this form. So like I said earlier, what they will go do is they, they want to adjust their recipe ratios. And they want to adjust their process settings to achieve a new product. So we're going to adjust. We want a new product here for Y. We know what we want over here. This, this is Y desired. We want to find what are the recipe ratios and what are the process settings we need to use to get to that Y desired. And what, what companies will do is they'll do a DOE. If they're doing it with any sort of structure, they'll do a DOE in the recipe ratios and they'll do a DOE in the process conditions. So if we want to make a new muffin, let's say, they'll say, well, I know that flour and oil are the two main variables that will affect the, the Y space, and in, regarding the process conditions, it might be the, the time duration with which we mix the batter and the temperature at which we bake it that has strong effect on Y. So we're gonna do a DOE in those four variables, and they may set up a two to the four factorial with 16 experiments or a fractional factorial, and run those experiments to, in, a, in a variation in order to achieve that Y design. And they'll use all the standard tools of experimental design, like response surface methods that we cover in the 4C3 course, or 6C3, for those of you that have taken it. They'll use all those standard techniques to try and achieve that Y design. And that's fine. That, that works and, and, and can work quite well. In but notice, there's one particular degree of freedom that they're not using. There's, when we're looking at these, these um, product design things, there's recipe ratios and process settings that they vary in the DOE. But this last point on using the raw materials and the properties of the raw materials, at no point are we ever using, in this particular data set, the properties of the raw materials. We don't have over here for ingredient one, let's say it's oil. We don't have the density and the viscosity of the oil and maybe some of the other taste properties of that oil. If there's an ingredient here, flour, we don't use the flour's property or the salt or any of the other ingredients that go into this product. Those, those are not, we're not using any of those physical properties of the raw materials here. So we're, we're leaving out a lot of information and, that's, and so what companies, they realize this, but what they'll often do is they'll say, well, I'm going to do a DOE, and let's say they've identified the four factors up here in, in the ratios as well as the process conditions. So they're going to do 
the two to the four experiment in those four variables. And then they'll come back down here, and then they've, so they've run their DOE by varying R and XP in those four variables. And let's say that DOE doesn't achieve the desired taste properties in Y, in y desired that they're looking for. What they'll go do is select a different set of raw materials, and then repeat the DOE and do another set of two to the four experiments with those new, newer raw materials. And they'll try, they'll repeat that as they get closer and closer to Y design. So it may take one or two iterations before they get there. But it's an excessive number of experiments. And the reason why they're not getting there so much faster is because they're not using any of the ingredient information. Okay, so let's see what the ingredient information looks like in the, in the data set. And then once you understand this slide, you'll see why they're not using it, because it's really tough to use. So here's the usual approach. We've got our process settings, our ratios, and our final properties. Why? The problem comes from the following. We've got a database over here of potential ingredients. Okay? So one ingredient for every row. And in the columns, we measure the various properties. So there could actually be many properties in that column direction. Viscosity, boiling point, melting point, all the standard chemical and physical properties that can describe those ingredients. Okay. And as you would expect, many of the properties in the columns here don't apply to all of the raw materials that you have in the rows. So they might be liquid ingredients and they might be solid ingredients. It's not necessarily appropriate to measure a melting point and a boiling point on a solid. For example, baking powder or flour. You wouldn't measure the melting point and boiling point on those, but you would measure that on an oil, for example. So there's going to be lots of gaps in this D matrix which are missing values. <coughs> what the company then goes and does is Let's take this D matrix and I'm going to transpose it. So I'm going to put one for every ingredient here is going to be horizontal and every property is going to be vertical. And I'm going to extract from the D matrix just the rows of the ingredients I actually use in my, in my process. So the D matrix is a, is a very large database of all potential ingredients. But the actual ingredients which I do use in my process, in other words, just a few rows from D, that I've actually used over here in my previous data set. I go take those rows, because I'm transposing it, they become columns. These are my ingredients now, and then within my rows are the properties. Okay, so the same number of properties that I measured over here in the columns of matrix D now become the rows of matrix I. Okay. And the reason why I transposed it is not to make it more difficult, but to try and align it up here for you with the ratio matrix. So, same number of columns as in the ratio matrix. If we notice here, let's say the first column was oil, I'll have along this particular column the ratio of oil used in all my recipes, but further up here in the I matrix, I'll have the physical properties of that oil. And if I'm using a flour or a baking powder, I would have the ratio for it over here, and then also that particular property, those, the particular properties for that. So the problem is, I've got all my ingredient information over here, and it's it, the, the properties of my ingredients in I. But I can't bring it down over here and use it in my model. There isn't a dimension in common. Okay? I don't have the row dimension over here, which is always PLS and PCA, even multi-block PLS and PCA. Always require that this, the number of rows be the same for all our blocks. So there's no way I can bring this information that's extremely valuable. I know that companies that don't use this approach know that their raw materials affect their final properties. But how do you bring this information into the model? Because there's no common dimensionality of it. So let's, let's just, uh, I just want to put where we're headed with this, so that you can see we're going to end up by the end of today's class. In context, we're, we're going to specify this Y desired. And from that, I'm going to convert that over to a particular set of scores, tau desired. 
And then we saw from the previous section, once I've got tau design, I can go back over here and get the properties of these various matrices in X and, and R. The, the process settings that I need to run it and the ratios I need to run. This is doable. Okay, so let's assume that I can go from Y desire to tau desire. I haven't shown you yet how to do that, but let's say I can convert this Y desire to tau desire. Going from tau desire to these original, these Xs, that's relatively straightforward. We use the, the approach I just showed before the break. But there's this part as well. How do we bring this ingredient information? We ideally would like to bring that ingredient information in here as well. Which ingredients should we use to make our recipe? Okay. That's the important de uh, degree of freedom which we're not using. So just back up here to the degrees of freedom. Recipe ratios is one degree of freedom. The settings for our process is another degree of freedom. But the other thing that we have control over to influence our why are which raw materials and ingredients to use. Choosing discrete raw materials in an integer way discrete raw materials or ingredients, we don't have the ability to, to bring that in. Or when we go backwards, we don't have the ability to land up and figure out which of the ingredients should we be using. Okay. So that's where we're heading to trying to solve this problem. So let me first show you, before we move on, one particular step we have to do here on why desire. I should have actually had this next slide really should have been early on. I'm not sure why it's well, it's my mistake for having to late. But let me just quickly talk about this topic of checking why desired, and then I'll come back to this, this topic I was just describing about. Why desired, you cannot just set it arbitrarily. Like we 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 have that we have this uh, we know that intuitively in fact. I cannot just arbitrarily go set Y desired. I need to make sure that Y desired is consistent with the previous products that I've made before. So what I need to do is I need to take this previous Y matrix of all my products that I've built, uh, made in the past, and build a PCA on, the, on that Y matrix. Then what I should go do, once I build a PCA on that, is use Y desired as a new observation. So, Take my Y desired, uh, my, my Y matrix, and now I'm going to take Y desired over here and just treat it like a new observation. The same way we normally do with X and PCA, except I'm going to call this Y, and instead of X new, I'm going to call this Y desired. And once I project this onto the model, there's the loadings matrix for this uh, PCA, I can go calculate its SPE and I can go calculate the T squared for this new data point. And if this Y desired falls below the SP and T squared, I'm okay. I can say, I can proceed on with the rest of the, the, the material I'm gonna show you next. If not, it's telling us the requirements for this new product that either you're, you're deciding on or your customer's deciding on are inconsistent with any of the previous products you've made in the process before. Okay. So it's kind of like asking someone to make a scone when all you've made are, are muffins. You're, you're asking to make something totally different to what you've normally made. It doesn't fit into the scope of products you've made in the past. Now, it's not a catastrophe if that happens, but I, we won't cover in the class today the situation on how to deal with it, but there is a way to deal with it. And I'll, Maybe I'll hint a bit about it at the end, but you can read more about it in Koji's thesis and Emily's thesis. There's a way to bootstrap yourself towards a model that does have this consistency. So uh, I, if I don't mention it at the end, please remind me and I'll talk about that point at the end of how we can get to this yes. So we might do this check initially and we get a no here, but there's a way to deal with that and eventually we get a yes. Okay, so, but for now, I'm going to assume that whenever we specify Y desired, it is within the SPE and T squared of the previous products we've produced. So that was a little bit of an aside. I should have spoken about that earlier. Yeah. Back to the mixture properties and uh, the, the ratios. Okay, so we've got our ratio matrix here, R, and the only dimension we have in common 
is this ingredient direction. So it's the ingredients and their ratios, and this is the ingredient and its particular properties. So what Koji's work uh, thesis did was to say, well, I can bring that information in if I calculate a new matrix called X mixture, and that mixture matrix is the product of the ratios and the, and the ingredients. So let's say R times I. So it may take a little while to understand exactly what the product does over here. So let me try to explain it as follows. Let's assume that my particular properties are the melting point, boiling point, and there's a few others in between, and the last two are viscosity and density. And those particular properties are measured on all my previous ingredients. Okay? So let's say I have 10 ingredients, Ki is 10 ingredients that I've used in the past. So the ratio values within each row, they'll sum up to one and there'll be 10 elements within each row that tells me how I need to combine those particular 10 ingredients. Many of these values will be zero. Okay? Because not all recipes will use all the ingredients. Some of the recipes just uh, use a, a smaller subset. But over all n recipes, I've used 10 ingredients. The product of R times I is a matrix X mixture that has R times I must have n rows over here, and you'll have p columns. Okay, so you'll end, you'll end up with that n by p matrix, where p is the number of properties, n is your number of recipes. And it describes for you, the within each, within each column, it will tell you the melting points, let's say, of each blend. For the first row here in I, we measured the melting point. This will be the melting point of the blend of all those ingredients I. The second column in X mixture will be the melting, the boiling point of the blend of materials, and so on. The viscosity in the final, in the second last column, and the last column will be the density of the blend of all the ingredients. And so that's, uh, if, if you work it out on paper with just a small example, you can prove it to yourself. But basically, this is saying, let's say I take an ingredient, um, ingredient one and ingredient two. And ingredient one contains 60% fat, and ingredient two contains 30%. Uh, and that's a bad let's, uh, let's work with density rather than percentages, because that's going to get confusing. So let's say uh, ingredient one has a density of 1,000, and ingredient two has a density of 1,500. If I use 20% of this ingredient, and I use 80% of that ingredient, I can calculate the blended density assuming linear combinations or assuming linear blending. So I'd say, well, this will be 200 plus 80% of 1,500, which is 1,200. Okay, so I'm going to get an average density of 1,400. So that's all that that mixture matrix is doing, is it's assuming linearity in the physical properties. Isn't it 1,200? Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, so it's a, it's just, it's making a, a very strong assumption that you can blend things linearly, and that the physical properties will blend linearly. If you know up front that a particular physical property does not blend linearly, and you know the nonlinear relationship of of how the blend should be, you can simply go replace this x mix matrix by that nonlinear function of R and I. Okay? If you know uh, ahead of time what that nonlinear function should be. But in the absence of that, you'll get a pretty reasonable estimate of X mix by just multiplying R times I. But for some products, it doesn't hold. Okay. Now we've got consistency. Because if we look at our X mix matrix, we've got N rows and P columns. Now we're, now we're ready to go back to PLS. Okay, so this is what the usual approaches for companies. They'll disregard their raw materials information, and they'll only use their process settings and their ratios. By using this blended matrix here, X mix, we're bringing in the ratio information and the raw material information into a single matrix, 
that has consistency on n rows and p columns. Now we're in business. We can do a multi-block PLS. We've got a block for the process settings, a block for the blend, and we can go use those two blocks to predict one. This works really well if your raw material properties are correlated with the Y. If your raw material properties have no effect on the Y, you won't lose anything, but this X mix matrix won't contain any new information for you. Basically, if you but it's very unlikely. I, I don't know of any situations where, too many situations where the ingredients have very little correlation with the Y. The ingredients usually are one of the strongest uh, variables affecting Y. So let's look at an example here. And then it's time for a break. So this is from Koji's thesis, his chapter two. He has a, this case study where, where Mitsubishi, no, no secret there that Mitsubishi, uh, is blending rubbers, oils, and polypropylene to create a new polymer. So they specify the polymer properties here, why? But our immediate uh, point with this case study isn't to, uh, isn't to run the model backwards yet. We'll get to that after the break. Our immediate point right now is to say how well does this X mix matrix work for us? Okay, so they have six rubbers in this R matrix. So here's the R matrix over here. I've cut off the, um, the process matrix. This process matrix, XP, for this particular case study, all the blends, all the recipes 1 to n, were made using the same process settings. So all the columns in that matrix are just constant, and so there's no need for that block. Okay, so that's why this case study just deals with the ratio matrix R and I. So we get, and then here's the X mix matrix, the product of R times I. So here's our n recipes for Ki ingredients. The first six columns are the ratios of the rubbers that we've used. Next two columns are the oil ratios, and the last three columns are the polypropylene. Mapping up here, corresponding to those first six columns, are the properties of the rubber in the bottom half of this uh, matrix. The oil properties corresponding to those two columns, and then the final uh, are the polypropylene properties. Those, this matrix I is assembled from this much, much larger sparse matrix D. Okay, where the, the dimension of D here is all the, all the potential ingredients, all the rubbers, all the oils, polypropylenes, and so on. We take the corresponding rows out of the D matrix, transpose them, and, and put that information over here. If we calculate the product X mix R times I, and then we build a PLS just between X mix and Y. Okay, so we, we don't really include R anymore. We, we just now take R times I, the mixture matrix, and build a PLS related to Y. So I'll, I'll come back, back to this line in a minute. But if you, if you do that, and we want to compare the two approaches, so XP, I, should, I shouldn't have had XP here, but XP is, is, is not, not used. So it's really just, the, this is the PLS relating R to Y. That has a Q squared of 32% using certain components. The mixture PLS relating X mixture to Y, again, just uh, please, this is an error, drop off X P over here. That PLS model with the same number of components, it has a Q squared value of 60%. So we get better prediction from a cross validated point of view of those Ys by bringing in the raw material information. That's the key, the key point over here. One other side issue to note, I just mentioned it up here, is that there were actually no ingredient properties for the polypropylene. Okay. So this particular section of the matrix is actually zeros. There were, or they were just, it was empty. There were no particular properties here. Okay. So when, what Koji did then, if you calculate X mix R times I, he did that for the rubber section, for the oil section, and then he just appended on at the end the ratio matrix of the polypropylene. So at least you want to maintain that ratio information because you don't have these four corresponding properties. But you do still want uh, to bring that ratio information in there. It is still of some value. So in fact, X mix really 
in this example wasn't the pure product, it was the product of the rubber sections, the oil sections, and then just appended on at the end uh, because it still has end rows. Every one of those sub matrices has end rows, and then you can still depend on the positive protein section. Okay? The uh, interpretation of this model is actually quite interesting. And as mentioned here, Koji, Koji mentions in his thesis that what you can learn from this W star C plot that we're going to look at next was what an experienced polymer chemist in Mitsubishi, uh, it, when basically when this was mentioned to that chemist, it made sense to him and, and, works, and, and, and gels with his or her previous experience. So from, that, from their experience, let's take a look at the W star C plots. The, the little plus symbols are the C variables and the circles are the W stars. So what we're interested in is how the properties of the Ys, there's eight particular properties, relate to the blends of the particular um, raw materials. So firstly, let's take a look at YP, where is it? Um, I guess we can just start up here, YP3. So okay, yeah, I was looking for YP1, 2, and 3. So those, those three C values indicate those three Y variables grouped together. And they're most strongly affected by the ratio of the polypropylene for that first polypropylene, and they're negatively affected by the second polypropylene ratio. So polypropylene, remember this was the, the one that was unusual, it's the one for which we only have the ratios available. We don't have the blended properties of the polypropylene. So there were three polypropylenes, one, two, and three. Polypropylene one's property and polypropylene two's ratio, they're strongly related to this Y variable in column one, Y variable in two, and Y variable in column three. Y variable in column four doesn't seem to be too much affected by any single one direction. Uh, it is somewhat in, in the first loading. The fifth Y variable is mostly negatively correlated with the seventh Y variable and mostly affected by the rubber blend properties one, two, and three. And so let's just take a look back up here. There were six rubbers. Six rubbers. But then the blends of those six rubbers The average blend of them, uh, where's Y, anyone else? So here, the blend property one, two, and three is strongly related, positively correlated to five, and negatively correlated to seven. There's also some effect then from polypropylene ratio three and the oils blend property two. Unfortunately, I really wish I had the real units. It's so vague to talk in ones, twos, and threes, but uh, for confidentiality, we're stuck with this. Uh, then also here's Y6. This is very strongly related to the oil property one. And so it's interesting that you've got this eight-dimensional Y space, but it can be mapped quite compactly just in two variables. There's also the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh latent variables. So by Q, the Q squared, we went up to seven variables, but most of the, the real information can be found here just from those two components and matches very interestingly with what an experienced person in the company would have figured out or, or would have expected. So I think I'm going to take a break here and then we're going to come back to this next step of running the model backwards. But before we go there, uh, or take a break, what is it? Any questions? So yeah, just to just to recap here, the mixture PLS property, uh, mixture PLS model, just bringing in your raw material information with your ratios, extremely powerful. Right? It, it's it's uh, it's a very nice way of bringing in what is normally stumps people is when you've got this matrix up here, which doesn't have a consistent dimension with the rest of your data set. Just a simple product of those two matrices can. Can uh, get you a long way and, and boost your predictive ability in the model quite a bit. So let's take a break here for a couple of minutes and then we'll.